we are nearing the end of Disability Pride Month, and we're highlighting all of those who've made an impact in educating on disability awareness. Eddie Ndopu is a Nambian disability rights global advocate who was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy at the age of two. He was told by doctors he wouldn't survive past five years old, but you see him there. He's 32 years old now, and he is not just surviving, he is thriving. And our Phil Lipoff sat down with the activist and advocate to discuss his inspiring journey in his new book, Sipping Dom Perignon Through a Straw. Let's talk about the title, because yeah. the title is a clever is a clever way to say, hey, this is what I'm about to get into. It's Sipping Dom Perignon Through a Straw. Mm -hmm. um, did you start with the title and then write the book, or did you write the book and find the title? The title sort of shaped the text. I have always felt that the way we have a conversation about accessibility feels very limited. What makes a space accessible is really the belonging and the dignity and the self-actualization that we all feel regardless of ability or identity once we're in that space. This ambition of inclusion that goes beyond the bare minimum, that goes beyond compliance. And sipping Dom Perignon through a straw felt like equal parts cheeky and um, incisive in terms of being able to articulate a vision of the world where I can have more. You've defied the odds at every step, but talk about the diagnosis, if you will, just so we can understand it. Sure. So I was diagnosed um, at the age of two uh, with spinal muscular atrophy, which is um, a motor neuron condition that affects the voluntary muscles and results in progressive weakness. So the older I get, the weaker I become. And I have, um, I've stopped counting at this point, but I've outlived myself by, I think 26, 27 years. Um, existential defiance, as my brother calls it. You discussed how lonely you felt mm -hmm. and how a kid can't really, how do you, dis how do you articulate yeah. you're lonely? So take me through that process. Yeah, I, I, I didn't really have the language um, to be able to articulate that sense of not feeling stimulated. Um, you know, I was in the company of a nanny um, growing up, and my mom, a, a fearless single mother, um, was at work, and, and my younger brother was, was at school, preschool, uh, kindergarten. Um, and I just knew from hearing Wonga, my younger brother, talk about his days at school that um, I, I was missing that connection um, with, with, with other children. And, and I think that um, it wasn't so much uh, about the day-to-day -day activities and you know, sort of the minutia of, of, of the classroom than it was really the ability to be able to meet other kids and um, really build um, that ability to, to interact um, and, and develop those interpersonal skills. I held my mom's hand and I just said to her, I want to be like Wonga. I want to go to school. So Maybe. tell me what your mother said and, and, and how supportive she was. You need to remember at the time, I came of age um, in the late 90s in Namibia, Southern Africa, and there weren't any children with disabilities like me in school. I was literally one of probably a handful in the entire country to be enrolled into a mainstream education. But she said yes, and she hit the pavement, and she knocked on every door that she could, and got a lot of no's, a lot of no's, and it took one yes um, from a school on the outskirts of town, and they're like, we're not sure if this can happen, but let's give it a go. Fast forward, um, you wind up at Oxford. I I'm, I'm wondering, during the schooling, at what point the kids around you your age, whatever age it was, did it just become second nature? I was a beneficiary of inclusive education, but I think the folks who benefited the most probably were my non-disabled counterparts. Um, I think that the kids that I grew up with became masters um, at being able to navigate inclusion um, in such a natural way. Um, and I think that that's the gift. When we have an inclusive classroom, the benefit isn't just 
for the person who's included, but it's for everybody else. We're all transformed and we're all changed when we're able to validate one another and recognize that we're all deeply and fundamentally human. You talk about taking your, sh taking your shot through the UN, um, you're going to be the first disabled person to travel into space. When did you start envisioning yourself in space or was that just an opportunity? Space to me was this metaphor. It was this, this, this giant stage um, where if I could say one thing to humanity, a 20 minute speech, what would I say? Because I became the first person with a disability in history to deliver a keynote address to the United Nations high level political I, forum. Um, as I take this podium, I do so with a profound sense of responsibility. I am not just a voice for the disabled, but a catalyst for change. Um, and it was truly an out-of-body experience, and I, I really felt that in some ways I was a representative for the community that I'm a part of, for the 1.3 billion disabled people in the world. I'm a bit of a daredevil and somewhat of a free spirit, and so anything that enables me to express myself fully, I go after. What do you want people to take away from this, both people within the, the disabled community mm. and, and maybe even so more importantly, yeah. outside of it? This is really a memoir that critically examines one's relationship with one's body and how that body interfaces with society. Um, I, I think, you know, my intention was to really be as honest and vulnerable as possible about the human condition. I think that ableism can dehumanize people with disabilities because ableism says there's only one way of being productive, one way of being valuable, one way of being beautiful, one way of being useful. And so my intention for this book is really to say that there are no limits, um, that we can pursue the greatest, most extraordinary lives that we can pursue, um, and that it's our job as people to support one another in that endeavor. What an incredibly inspiring interview, and our thanks to Phil Lipoff for that. Eddie's book, Sipping Dom Perignon Through a Straw, is out wherever books are sold on August 1st. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.